welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with my co-host, Stu Miniman, analyst at wikibon.org. And uh, we're here at the Red Hat Summit Live, getting all the action. And one of the things we love about going to the Cube is we like to go out, be independent, talk to the thought leaders, ask the tough questions, not so much that people just walk out and leave, but we want to be engaging and friendly. And our next guest is uh, Gene Kim, who is the author of The Phoenix Project, um, tech geek, at tech athlete, as we say, um, really in, in, in deep in the DevOps. And you were just at the Chef conference I saw on your, your Twitter. Welcome oh. to theCUBE. <laughs> Welcome Delighted to, the to be here. Uh, so Stu and I love talking about DevOps because we get to really kind of talk about something that's really emerging, cutting edge, bleeding edge, but very relevant to the conversations that are happening around Red Hat, and certainly around the major innovations going on around this tech bubble, this tech innovation, whatever you want to call it, we're seeing massive growth, we're seeing a massive paradigm shift where software is at the center of the value proposition and where virtualization and technology and open source is a tier one citizen enabling that. And the DevOps mindset is driving it. So I want to get your take on, um, where, where do you, what's your take on DevOps today? And it's not just a corner case of dudes who are eating glass and spitting nails, <laughs> it's now going mainstream. You know, I, uh, like you, we go to all these conferences and it's just, uh, I love that because you're surrounding yourself with some of the best you know, thinkers in the space, and the best practitioners in the space. But what I love being here at uh, Dev Nation and the Red Hat Summit is to see that DevOps is such a prominent part of the program. And so, you know, in my mind, you know, to see that even, you know, uh, your mainstream developer cares about the downstream consequences of the code we write, and we actually do want the code to run reliably and predictably in production. Yeah, you know, that is, uh, you know, probably like you, it just warms my heart. And it says that, you know, DevOps is not just for the few, it's really for, it's not just for the one percenters, it's for all of us. So Gene, I want to ask you, because I also want you to uh, talk about the Dev Nation things. That's obviously trending here at Red Hat Summit, a lot of activity. But if you go back seven years ago, yeah. you could have a barbecue and invite all the DevOps guys to it, they'd all show up. Uh, you get a handful of guys, now it's an industry. So I want you to talk about the evolution of the industry and what's going on at the Dev Nation. What, what are the conversations happening around DevOps? You know, I think uh, what we are observing is the emerging uh, uh, of continuous integration and continuous delivery as a standard practice. So it's not just for Amazon and Google and Etsy and Netflix, right? This is for any developer who wants to have fun doing their job. And I think one of the lessons I learned in the DevOps community and the continuous delivery community, this came from Jez Humble, is that you know, what we all want is you know, fast feedback, right? You know, no one actually achieves their goals when it takes us you know, six weeks or maybe six months to determine whether our code even runs. Right, and so that requires you know automated testing. That means quick deployments to the production, and that even involves you know something that we would have or I would have thought was you know uh, you know immoral developers doing their own deploys, right? You know, and yet you know I think that if we were to conjure up as uh, you know former developers when we were actually having the most fun, it was actually when we wrote the code, deployed the code, you know got to see it in production and fixed it and could fix it right away by ourselves. And I think that's kind of the end state for both development and operations. I mean, you love to do QA in context to your baby, but not be just doing QA on yeah. someone else's work. And the old model was, you know, very you know linear process, developers, product managers, pass off the developers, developers build the QA, and then you have guys shipping it. Now it's different. It's right. much more of a personal thing. No, absolutely, and I think, you know, in contrast, right, whenever we have to rely entirely on someone else to test our code, deploy the code, right, and then we, you know, it takes them six weeks. I think that really does take a lot of the joy out of, uh, you know, of coding. And I think it's one of those amazing things where it's great for development, great for test, great for operations, and good for the organizations we serve. So let's, let's talk about, for the folks out there, uh, let's unpack DevOps and kind of take it a little bit uh, higher level. I mean, let's talk about things like infrastructure as code, agile programming. These are buzzwords that you hear around that, that talk about kind of a methodology. Um, but let's talk about how broad is the definition now? How has DevOps changed, Gene, in terms of the, has it changed, has it broadened, and what have we learned and you know, what is it? What is the DevOps all about? Is it programming infrastructure? Is that it? Is it a, is it a mindset? <coughs> is it a culture? Yeah, I think you know, there are, there's not a very precise definition of what DevOps is, but in my mind, you know, DevOps is not so much of what you do, it's what the outcomes, right? You know, show me the results. And I think the hallmark of any great DevOps shop is they have very fast flow of features in the production where they can quickly go from code being written to code deployed, code running. Um, and that's where you get to, you know, hundreds or thousands of deploys per day. But it's also, uh, you know, the fact that they can do that and have world-class stability, reliability, and availability and security. 
And so before DevOps, you know, I think most of us, the way we were trained is you, ha you could do one, but not the other. You could be agile, but not reliable. Or you could be reliable, but then you're not agile. And the fact that what the unicorns have shown us, the Googles, the Amazons, and the Etsy's, they've really shown that you can actually do both at the same time. And uh, you know, that's, not, that's what every organization needs to be able to create inside their own organizations. Fast flow and reliability and stability. So what do you guys tell about the dev nation? Because obviously Linux hits a sweet spot because it's an interesting dynamic going on with Red Hat, around Red Hat. You have a company publicly held, yeah. dealing with open source communities, <laughs> which is a whole conversation of itself. And they have huge enterprise customers, yes. right? So that have built businesses on open source, all that go into the cloud. So this continuum from data center to the cloud, and now DevOps is kind of like in, in the middle of it, kind of creating some energy. Absolutely. So, so what what is DevOps doing to the traditional enterprises who are now rolling out and building business solutions around, which is development software, yes. and then the open source communities as well? You know, I, I think it's actually what DevOps is doing for large enterprises is, and you know, the CIOs that uh, run these IT organizations is providing a solution to the challenge they face, which is, you know, how do you get to market more quickly? How do you foster, you know, the ability to innovate? And you know, name one large organization that uh, you know doesn't have an innovation you know initiative, or maybe you know have a culture statement that says we need to innovate. I think what DevOps allows uh, them to do is to actually create the capability to rapidly experiment, rapidly prototype, um, and then quickly scale that if uh, if we create a winner. Okay, so this is what I want to do. I want to go down the line, starting with myself, Gene, then Stu. I want to ask you for your DevOps moment. When did you have that DevOps moment where you said, damn, this is real? Uh, so I'll start. So I think the iPhone was interesting. I think that created some buzz around connectedness and, and social media and all that stuff. But to me, it was the iPad was the DevOps moment because what that showed people in businesses was, wow, I want everything on this. And then IT would be like, oh, we, we can't do that. But the guys who were doing DevOps said, no problem. I can put that together and then quickly built out some middleware yep. and made that happen. Yes. Analytics, for example. So to me, the iPad was the DevOps moments because the business outcome, the business manager said, hey, can, can I bring this to work and can I run it on that? So to me, that was the DevOps moment. Oh, amazing. You know, for me, it was in 2007. Um, uh, well, I was uh, with a friend of mine, he's a CTO of AOL, uh, American Online, right? Uh, and you know, he's, we were talking about the operations uh, problem of, uh, you know, what really happens when operations can't upgrade the Linux 2.4 kernel to the 2.6 kernel? And he shared with me this aha moment where he said, that is not an ops problem, that's not even a development problem. Because the effect of that was that they needed the multi-threading support that only Linux 2.6 had, uh, the kernel support. And he said, it was like a nine month code freeze where we had the code written but we couldn't run it in production and you know, we lost this deal and that deal and we had to do all these other things to correct for the, uh, you know, to compensate for the revenue that we couldn't attain. And he said, that is not an ops problem. That's not even a dev problem. That's why, that is my boss's boss's biggest problem. And for me, that was a, a really an aha moment that says, what the problem that DevOps solved is not just ops or dev, but it's really people and the business, you know, the businesses that we serve. So. Uh, Okay, Stu, I'm putting you on the spot now. So, 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 so John, uh, the eye-opening moment for me on DevOps was actually at Amazon reInvent last year. Ah. I mean, just to see, you know, some of some of the gaming and mobile, you know, just whole new, uh, you know, companies just spawning out of being able to spin something up quick and, uh, you know, go. It was just a different world. I mean, I come from really the enterprise world, and you think about how long it takes to, you know, build a process and make things change, and, and, and here, you know, it was really an immersed culture of people that, you know, don't do things the old way and, and know that, you know, that there's just so much potential out there. In fact, I have another uh, DevOps moment that I just, I can't resist sharing. There's a guy named Patrick Lightbody. He uh, was the founder of a company called Browser Mob. So it was one of the first massive load testing tools in the cloud. And I remember he gave a presentation at Velocity and he said, we found that when we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever, right? And it was just, for me, it was yeah. a huge- Motivation. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, to have shared goals, we have to have shared pain. And you know, I think that's when I think I really gained a better understanding of the mechanics of DevOps. Yeah, so Gina. I mean, I'm sorry, John, I'm just curious, when you talk to all of the developers out there, how much is open source, you know, uh, you know, where is it on their list of, you know, things that they care about and, and are passionate about? Well, I mean, so when you talk about like this incredible, uh, you know, innovation happening where people are going to, uh, uh, you know, concept to prototype to potentially something running at scale, 
you know, in general, right, you can't do that if it takes nine months to go through procurement cycles, right, uh, or maybe even years, right? So the fact that, you know, we can do so much with things that are available out there, we can leverage, you know, patterns that other people have uh, generated and are presenting here at DevNation, uh, it is, in many ways, in my mind, we live in an age of miracles, right? We can do so much that we couldn't even think possible, uh, you know, five years ago. Yeah, so uh, I, I was uh, looking at the future of open source survey that came out last week, ah. and they said over half of all enterprises will be contributing code ah. back into the stream, uh, you know, basically this year. Um, so my question for you is, you know, do we want everybody to be coding? I mean, or you know, wh wh where is that balance as to you know who should participate uh, and, and be part of uh, you know the development of code? Yeah, I think. Um you know, as human beings, as developers, what you know we really get fulfillment out of is you know contributing back, right? Um, and you know uh, it doesn't have to be code necessarily; it's documentation. It could be tests, and I think uh, the community needs that and values that. And you know there was a one of the great presentation that was given at DevNation was uh, the head of open source at Facebook, and so uh, Facebook has often had a reputation of creating these things like memcache, these great open source projects, and then neglecting it for five years. <laughs> and so, essentially, you know, he's uh, had a nine month, uh, he was describing the nine month journey of rebooting that process to make sure that, you know, Facebook as a creator, they have responsibility to bring every enhancement back to the community um, and uh, maintain, you know, the code repositories on GitHub or so forth. And I thought that was just a, an amazing story where, um, you know, that is, I think, gives us a hint of why organizations want their engineers to be contributing back to the community. And Facebook uh, has a significant management commitment to uh, you know, make sure that you know, they contribute back. Yeah. In, in the open source community, there's really some of the luminaries out there that have helped driven some of the contribution. I mean, everything from Linus Trevalas, yeah. you know, Jim Whitehurst, the people running Drupal. Yeah. Um, you know, in the developer world, you know, who are the, those you know, kind of luminaries out there that are helping to you know, pull pull the industry along. <laughs> you know, um, I did hear this uh, yesterday, uh, is actually Docker is a number two uh, active repository open source project right now with over 400 contributing developers. So uh, when you pull that uh, you know, report on GitHub, you know, it's number two. So uh, apparently that's, and incidentally you can't help but notice that you know, half the, uh, you know, all of the second half of yesterday were uh, talks on Docker. It's interesting, a developer conference talking about Docker, it's just awesome. It really shows that the dev and ops world really have uh, crossed and uh, you know, that there's common, uh, you know, we even both care about the same things. So we interviewed Patrick on theCUBE. You mentioned Patrick uh, as a DevOps, and you know, he's an inventor of a variety of things, but I wanted to be, that spurred my, my memory around some components of DevOps that's really not being talked about here because it's more of an OS show, and that's the evolution of Node. Node.js mm -hmm. has become really a very important uh, component of DevOps because now, the guys who do DevOps, the, the developers, who ha are the younger guns, it's the older guys who want to move fast, who aren't quote network gurus or infrastructure guys, um, they're coders. They move fast, they break stuff as Mark Zuckerberg would say. So Node has become a really big part of the DevOps culture. You know, What's your I, take on that? You know, it's uh, one of the great things about going to all these conferences, you get to see the amazing thing that people are working on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, I think this goes back to the theme of you can do so much with so little. Uh, I heard a story about how the Walmart uh, e-commerce team uh, was able to uh, uh, increase the rate of transaction they were doing by a factor of like you know 10, 100 x by essentially you know uh, cobbling together something in Node.js. I mean, it is, you know, this is something that you know 10 years ago, you know, you would rely 100% on your hardware vendor. You know, you'd have to put an emergency engineering uh, order in, and uh, probably have to spend spend a million dollars, and they did it you know in a half day. Well, I mean, this is you know. Tell me that's not amazing. So we have, there's a startup uh, called CrowdChat, which we're involved in, and uh, I'm the co-founder of with uh, Dave Vellante and Danny Ryan, and we use Node.js for the CrowdChat application, and we originally did it on Hadoop and HBase. And when we put it to Amazon, it was like we saved three hires, <laughs> okay? No admins, we'd have to have a lot of and more engineering help. Fully integrated stack, elastic being done auto scaling, so as coders, our team was to have the ability to actually push code and iterate really, really fast, and versioning control. I mean, this is the new generation. The, the notion of updating a Linux patch, that's kind of like going out the door. Yeah. I mean, that's gone. So DevOps is, is, a, is a mindset. Um, it's also, it also seems to be the, the, 
the method, the preferred experience for the younger developers. Do you agree, and, and what, what, what can you share on that trend? You know, I, had, I saw a, a fantastic session that was part of the Red Hat Executive Summit, and uh, the gentleman, uh, he was the director of IT at Intel, and you know, he said he spent 22 years in the fabs, right, in, in the manufacturing domain, right, and only two years in IT, and he said, you know, one of the things that they have in common, they have many things in common, uh, but the, the one thing that really stood out to him was the fact that what really kept him up at night was, you know, the, the human factors, right, is that uh, in manufacturing, you know, over a, a decade, the skills in the uh, manufacturing workforce, you know, change what was needed, right? And he said, in IT, it happens so much faster, right? You wake up one morning and you find out you're, re you're irrelevant, right? And so <laughs> I think that it's good news and bad news is that, you know, it's great for the young engineers who uh, can bring these capabilities quickly to bear. On the other hand, what do you do with the people who have been uh, doing essentially the same thing for 20 years yeah. and now uh, have to generate, you know, some new skills in order yeah, to they got Yeah, they got to get relevant or they're going to be out of a job. I mean, that idea of complacency is interesting. You're seeing even at the computer science programs in most of the major colleges and universities, it's interdiscipline is the huge deal. So, you know, I think that's a macro trend that's crossing over where, you know, you got to be able to do a couple things Absolutely. really, really well. Right, um, and, and so I think the, the real challenge is, you know, is uh, anyone who uh, leads an IT organization is how do you, you know, elevate the average skill level so that this is not a 1% uh, only the one percent benefit, but the, you know we can actually, you know, increase everybody's ability to, uh, you know, achieve their own goals. Yeah. Now we were talking earlier about uh, some of the open source dynamics, and uh, you know the old expression "herding cats" really comes from software engineering, where you know it, now it's more of a social interaction too, because now you have to have good teamwork, a little bit different. You know, with DevOps, you know, you you're, you vote with code, you are your code, right? So there is much more of a personal social angle with DevOps. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I, one of my passions is benchmarking high performers. And so in 2012, we benchmarked 4,200 organizations with uh, Puppet Labs. And our goal is to really you know, find out what high performers is doing and what causes high performance. And so in year two of the benchmarking, we benchmarked 9,600 organizations. And one of the single best predictors of performance, performance is defined by you know, deploys per day, lead time, you know, how quickly can you go from code committed to running in production, change success rates, mean time to pair. The single best predictor of performance was, is there a high trust, you know, is it a high trust organization or low trust? In other words, is it a culture of fear or is it a culture of genuine innovation and high trust? And that one question you know, was the most effective predictor of IT performance. So it really is true, right? It yeah. is all about the, uh, the softer side of uh, uh, being working in teams. Gene, great to talk with you because I really believe, I've always said on theCUBE, and we love to pound the DevOps message, it's, it's a lot of different things, but it's also a cultural and now a mind shift, mindset and a cultural shift. Um, but we're still back to software engineering. So I want to get your take on DevNation. You've been leading that, you've been out there, uh, out there uh, talking with the folks out there. What's going on at DevNation? What's the big uh, news, conversations, discussions uh, out of DevNation? Yeah, I guess uh, there were two uh, themes that I just loved endlessly. One was, uh, you know, the increasing adoption of, you know, DevOps practices in more mainstream development projects. And the other thing was uh, everything around uh, platform as a service, Docker, uh, where it really does start changing, you know, what development produces. Whereas before, uh, you know, we would just hand off our executable code. Now the goal is to you know, hand off something that operations can immediately put into production and deploy, right? And so, uh, in my mind, this is the, it's almost like in manufacturing, when the plant engineers realized their end customer was not the person who was driving the car, it was actually the plant manufacturers working on the plant floor. And so I think what, how that transformed manufacturing is exactly what's happening in the software engineering space as well. Good vibe over there? Ah, oh, it's awesome. Yeah, it's been a great two days. <laughs> DevApps guys, I always say, eat glass and spit nails. It's like, they do stuff that you'd like, wow. But that's becoming more mainstream. In large enterprises, how does a guy who works at a company you mentioned doing some old things, how do they become a DevOps guy? Or is it just a new title called Cloud Ops? <clears throat> uh, is there, do you see something shifting there? I mean, how does someone become a DevOps guy? You know, or is that the superheroes of, of, of coding? I mean, can, can you be, can you be, can it be taught? Yeah, can it course, be learned? Yeah, oh, of course, in fact, uh, I would say this, you know, what, would be, what would be my three tips to any developer who uh, wants to uh, join the DevOps tribe? I think one is read the book, Jez Humble's uh, book, Continuous Delivery. Because it really, uh, you know, from, from a developer's perspective, 
you know, uh, describes what does the product owner, dev, test, and operations, what do we have to do differently uh, in order to facilitate fast flow. The second thing is, uh, you know, I would recommend going to any DevOps days. Uh, the Velocity Conference uh, is one of my favorites. Uh, in fact, uh, we're now holding a conference, we're calling it DevOps Enterprise, uh, where the goal is to really capture. Oh, uh, it's actually, uh, the program committee is like John Willis, and Adrian Cockcroft, and Damon Edwards, uh, Dominica DeGrandis, the smartest people I know. Our goal is to really uh, help create a different narrative of DevOps, you know, where it's not about Etsy and Amazon and Google, instead it's Macy's and yeah. Disney and General Motors, right, describing how they've transformed. Yeah. And if there were a third one? Is uh, that scheduled or is that? Uh, is oh that yes, in fact I'll send you the information, it's going to be October 21st to October 23rd. Uh, Here? Uh, in San Francisco, yes. Great, okay, just make sure I get that out there, get a quick plug for it. So you basically that's a conference of getting it less out of the geeky, one-offs, yeah. hyperscale, web yeah. hyperscale dudes, yeah. to mainstream. Yeah, and in fact there's actually one other thing that, uh, you know, that I would recommend any developer do. I think it's now common practice, right, that every developer should watch their customers use their code, right, uh, you know, for at least a couple hours, right? And for me, I remember when I did that in 2006, I almost threw up, I, I felt, there was certain, there was a one routine operation that we expected everybody to do, and it took 62 clicks. <laughs> and, and, and any decent human being you know, would uh, feel so guilty for that. I think in a DevOps context, you know, what I would recommend every developer to do is not just watch the users use their code, but watch the deployment process. And uh, you know, see what the operations people have to do in order to uh, put it into production. And I think watching that will change uh, people's mindsets just as, you know, watching them run their code. Okay, we're here with Gene Kim. Final, a final word I'll give to you on this segment is, what are you doing next? Share with the folks what's going on in your world. Uh, what are you working on? New book, new yeah. code, new event. Obviously, we just heard. Uh, what, what are you working on? What's next for you? Okay, so, uh, the Phoenix Project came out uh, one year ago, January. So, that's been the, one of the most fun adventures I've ever been on. Uh, right now, we're in the final stages of trying to get the DevOps cookbook out. So, whereas the Phoenix Project was a novel about, uh, you know, IT, DevOps, and helping our organizations win, uh, the DevOps cookbook is really meant to be the prescriptive guide. So if I want to do DevOps, you know, here's a step-by-step -step, uh, set of principles and the step-by-step -step, uh, set of patterns that organizations can actually put into place to replicate the transformation that's described in the Phoenix Project. Okay, we are here inside the Cube at the Red Hat Summit, always talking to all the best people can find, sharing the knowledge and sharing it with you on the Cube. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break, talking DevOps, open source, operating systems, uh, all kinds of greatness here. So we'll be right back after this short break. Thank you.